Uh, well, my friends, uh, welcome back to the Great Books Club. It's 8.34 uh, p.m. Bucharest time, and I'm truly delighted for one very specific and obvious reason. Tonight, we are going to talk about Roger Scruton, and I called him the king of philosophical conservatism for um, very obvious uh, reasons, one of them being the fact that he uh, ran the risk of losing his life or being arrested in the late 70s and the late and the early 80s when he visited countries like Poland, like Czechoslovakia, like Hungary, in order to offer books, great books, and sometimes small books to anti-communist dissidents living in Eastern Europe under under the very oppressive regime of communism. Uh, Roger Scruton was uh, truly an outstanding figure of uh, British philosophy. He was um, a student of Kant and of Spinoza, among others. He was a great critic of Derrida and many other post-structuralist uh, philosophers in France. He was also a journalist and uh, probably uh, you know of him because of uh, a very wide, widespread presence of his name also in the media. He, I think, produced one of the most impressive and persuasive documentaries on beauty, and I highly recommend you to uh, watch that doc documentary on beauty. He was also in touch, um, especially in the later years of his uh, life, he was in touch with, uh, with many other uh, leading conservative figures such as Jordan Peterson. He had a conversation held in Oxford with uh, Jordan Peterson about the meaning of transcendence. In a sense, he was uh, struggling and grappling with the issue of the sacred, with, um, with the faith uh, in general, with the faith of Christians in particular. And uh, he probably reconciled himself with God by also being a very avid um, parishioner in, a, in an Anglican church. He was also, also found oftentimes playing uh, either the piano or uh, perhaps other instruments in a traditional Anglican church. In order to talk to us about Roger Scruton in general and about a specific book on conservatism by Roger Scruton, we have uh, a very special guest. He's a friend of ours. Trey Dimsdale, who lives in the United States as the executive director of the Center for Religion, Culture, and Democracy. He is responsible for establishing the priorities of this organization, which I'm part of, a proud member of. And he is also a great fan of the Transatlantic Alliance when it comes to building bridges uh, by uh, reading and um, and writing about great authors uh, who have shaped the uh, European and American mindset from a conservative and libertarian pers perspective. He also held a director level role at Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty, where we have met uh, probably more than five years ago. He published also a book called Work, Theological Foundations and Practical Implications. So, uh, Trey, it's a great joy. It's a great pleasure to have you on. And please uh, consider making your presentation for about like 40, 45 minutes. And then uh, we will have time for discussions. Uh, our Romanian and American audience is very eager to learn more about uh, Roger Scruton from you. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mihail. I appreciate it very much. I appreciate the introduction and the invitation. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so, so Roger Scruton's one, one, I think it's, it's his next to last book. I think he had one other book that he published called How to Be Conser a Conservative uh, before he passed away in the last few years. Is this book, um, which is getting blurred out because of my setting here, but Conservatism and the Invitation to, a, to the Great Tradition. And it's very, um, it's a very brief, uh, very accessible but also um, an excellent uh, and inspiring, uh, inspiring introduction to, uh, to conservative thought. And there's a lot of directions that we can, uh, we can go here, but there's, there's, I think that there's a few things that 
you know, given the brevity of the time we have to discuss this, that um, directions that I would I would like to go, and I guess uh, during the Q and A or at a at a point where um, Mihail or, or any of the participants would like to interrupt, um, that would that will work for me, and we can um, we can go off of the off of the trail a little bit. Um, but a lot of what Scruton is attempting to accomplish in this book and does I, I think quite well is to draw uh, lines between conservatism and classical liberalism to differentiate between the two, at least here in the United States. Uh, and then also, I think, to some extent in his context in the UK, um, the lines become blurred uh, between conservatism and classical liberalism because there's, there's a shared vision for uh, you know, maybe the, the final shape that society might take um, even if the pathway there is different from a conservative uh, adopt, uh, ad adopting the conservative first principles versus a, a classically liberal worldview. And, um, and also the, the project of fusionism uh, over the course of the last 25 or 30 years has also served to blur the line so that there's there's um, a lot of uh, a lot of confu popular confusion I think you could say on the distinction between conservatism and uh, classical liberalism. Now I will say that I am, you know, for pragmatic reasons, a fusionist. There are things that conservatives and uh, classical liberals and libertarians can uh, cooperate on uh, without having to. Uh, to um, um, compromise core beliefs, uh, it was a it was a, a important and notable uh, sort of argument here in the United States, seventies into the eighties, um, between uh, um, Hayek and uh, Russell Kirk, um, that you know, that that both had a, both were asserting uh, sort of the, the dominance of of their particular views. Hayek being the classical liberal end of the spectrum, um, and uh, Russell Kirk obviously being a noted um, leading uh, conservative thinker. And so Roger Scruton does uh, for us a, a great service in writing uh, in, in, a, in a very uh, significant time in being able to debunk, to sort of differentiate between, uh, between these views. Um, and one of the things that I would note about sort of the direction I think that will head is he makes fleeting references in a few places uh, to Blackstonian thinking, uh, the framing of the American Constitution, the understanding of, of um, you know, the, the conservative tradition and also the, the view for organizing society that you see represented in the American Constitution. And the events of even the last few days here in the United States, I think, have um, brought some of those things into focus. Um, and those, those may be some, some differences that are not as common to, uh, to, to, to Europeans who have interest in these things um, as uh, to the Anglo-American audience to whom uh, Scruton was, was primarily writing. So I guess we can start off um, with uh, you know the way that Scruton frames, and I and I, I, I sorry to interrupt you, the tray. Sure. We can hear you well, but there's a constant noise coming from like a wooden surface or something. There's always a noise which interrupts with your voice, and it's uh, unfortunate because uh, ideally we would like just to hear your voice. But okay. if you if you have touched things, it's better not to touch them. If you've touched the keyboard or something, it's better not to touch it because it's, it's a I'm, loud noise. Sure, I think I'm brushing into my um, the charger, the charging cord on my uh, my computer. So that's okay. That's, Sorry to interrupt little, you. I'll try to. I'll try to. I'll try to keep back from it. I apologize for that. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, so Scruton, Scruton, you know, kind of lays out the. Uh, the development of conservatism, um, philosophical conservatism, and how it kind of spills out into um, sort of a more pragmatic or political manifestation of, of those ideas and traces conservatism 
back to the Enlightenment period, a reaction to um, you know, problems or, or excesses uh, of um, you know, ideas, liberal ideas that, uh, that emerged uh, from the Enlightenment. And um, <coughs> I'm sorry, excuse, I have a bit, bit of allergies going on right now. So that's, that's also a challenge here in addition to touching this power cord. <laughs> um, and uh, so, so he is, uh, so, so Scruton is, um, has traced back, you know, and, and spends a good bit of time um, uh, laying out for the reader you know, the development of, 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 of conservatism kind of coming together and congealing uh, and becoming a, uh, you know, a, a structured and formal, formally, uh, formally expressed um, philosophy and, and, and political view, view of way of seeing the world. In fact, that's, that's actually what he, how he describes it. Conservatism is not a, not a political view. It's a, it's a distinct and unique way of understanding the world. And what had ultimately come out of the enlightenment that conservatism is responding to is a hyper focus on uh, liberal individualism, which was the understanding of the individual as being uh, the fundamental building block of society. Now, most libertarians that you would encounter today, especially ones that have some sort of of um, religious commitment, not all are agnostic or, or, or atheistic in their in their worldview. Would uh, would would argue that that is somewhat of a um, of a, a gross simplification, oversimplification of their perspective. But the um, the the liberal view that 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 was that emerged from the Enlightenment basically atomized uh, you know the individual gave rise to the idea that no man could possibly be bound um, by obligations. It was a Hobbesian view, uh, could, could possibly be bound by obligations um, that came from anything but his own actions or his own will, that there's a, uh, there must be some sort of um, explicit consent, either, either um, by action or by um, participation in society that would obligate a person to, uh, to the uh, particular norms of a society. Um, the conservative impulse, the conservative reaction to that um, rejects this idea that people are not atomized individuals. The fundamental building block of society is actually communities um, and uh, that these communities are uh, you know, at the most fundamental level, there, there is some some measure of disagreement in the conservative world, but not 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 to some sort of a serious extent. And this would certainly be Scruton's view that families are a pre-political community. There is a requirement of uh, of two people coming together in a certain specific type of relationship that gives rise to a no next generation, and that this is. Uh, this is in itself a, a community in which, uh, you know, the, the, the child that comes into it has consented to birth, has consented to become a part of the community, but is nonetheless um, entitled both to, uh, to the rights that are involved in being a part of that community, but also then obligated as well to those, to the uh, duties uh, that are imposed upon him. And so uh, this, in, this emphasis that, that the enlightenment places on, on the individual, ultimately um, we will see unfold over the course of, of, of several, um, over several uh, generations and centuries leads to an, an atomized understanding of the individual where the individual's um, desires and wishes are are ultimately supreme over, over any other type of, uh, of restraining influence. And um, the, the good of the community is, is forgotten. The good of any community that an individual might be a member of is, is, totally, is, totally, um, is totally forgotten. And it's a problem that we ultimately are even sort of addressing um, in the present day uh, in um, you know, sort of the rise of, of uh, therapeutic individualism, 
um, that has given rise to sort of like this radical understanding of self-identity, self-identification uh, as being a preeminent um, source of, of, of personal identification rather than identification um, with the particular communities um, with which a person into which a person belongs. Um, even though the irony is that we still see these groups referring self referring to themselves as communities. Um, and uh, so this is this is what this is essentially what conservatism is trying to remind us of. I mean, in the most simplistic terms that you are not an atomized individual, that you exist inside of a context and in relationship to other individuals in ways that are significant and in ways that are, or are, are inextricable. You simply cannot pull yourself um, away and define yourself in, uh, in, a, in a way that is, um, that is uh, um, abstract or divorced from, um, the, the context into which you were born or you live uh, or you function or you relate. And so this individual, um, or I'm sorry, this communal um, sense of, uh, of identity is something that, that re returns back throughout the, uh, um, you know, Scruton's work, but, but he points out these different points in uh, the history of conservative thought where different thinkers will point point out this communal aspect of, of an individual's identity um, over time. And, and actually, um, one of the few uh, thinkers, the few theistic thinkers and writers that uh, Nietzsche actually conceded to having learned from was Dostoevsky. And Dostoevsky's recipe for uh, a solution or escape from nihilism uh, is a return to the soil, a return to rootedness and, I, and, and belonging and settledness inside of a, of a context, inside of, of, of uh, a community where there are individuals that are relating to one another. Um, and uh, so this, this theme is a theme that runs throughout all of conservative thought con uh, and, and Scruton points this out to us quite, uh, quite ably. So conservatives tend to be um, and should be um, locally focused, both in terms of time and place. Uh, they, it, it, there's um, another, another conservative thinker and writer who's uh, in, in, has always enjoyed um, a good, deal, good bit of appreciation in the Anglo-American tradition uh, is C.S. Lewis. And oftentimes he's not given credit for the fact that, he, that there's so much um, that's, that's rich within his writings that go beyond simply sort of Christian pietism or or um, or something like that, and he actually speaks to um, uh, to issues that are important in in, um, in even political philosophy. Uh, next year, twenty twenty three marks the eighty fifth anniversary of his book Abolition of Man, and there's for those of you that are not familiar with it, he spent a good bit of time talking about and responding to the eugenics movement. Um, that was um, that was um, quite powerful uh, during during a portion of his lifetime in the middle part of the 20th century, and he actually points to this as an anti-conservative movement because it's a movement that is not he's not even necessarily talking about it. I mean, he does talk about it in moral terms, but it's a it's a movement that's not focused on time and place. It's binding a future generation. Uh, to decisions that are made in the present, and to some extent, there's, there's that's an inescapable thing. We make decisions, we make um, we make political decisions and policy decisions um, that are that we have to make in real time in the present. Uh, but a conservative doesn't understand themselves um, simply as being owners of the present moment. A conservative would think of themselves as being a trustee. A conservative has inherited something from the past, institutions, uh, a civiliza civilization, to just say most, most broadly. Um, conservatives understand themselves as having, having inherited something from those who've come before and being trustees on behalf of the generations that will follow. A conservative is aware of his place in history. And this is why he settles and he invests inside of a circle um, that, that allows for the preservation of these ideas. Uh, I actually heard um, a, uh, a retired um, 
judge this week giving a talk uh, where he, he, he titled the talk, The Story of Us. And um, he, was, he was giving a talk that was, that was sort of the thrust of it was, you know, how it is that a, a conservative judge um, in the Anglo-American common law tradition is differentiated from an activist judge, regardless of which end of the spectrum. Uh, and uh, um, the goal, he said, and this is sort of a crude, simplistic sort of way to, to phrase it, but the goal of a, um, of a uh, conservative jurist is to, to allow for the next chapter of the story of us to be written, um, not to try to guide the, uh, the, the writing of the story or the next chapter, but to preserve a system that allows that those these chapters to successively successively be written. But um, so the reason why to return back to scrutiny, the reason why conservatism is so concerned with the the time and locally focused in terms of both time and place has much to do with political legitimacy. If uh, in all of human history we can see a pattern of uh, you know, rebellion against the foreign imposition of laws and customs. And it's laws, and it's, it's laws that, that give rise from local customs that are the ones that, that, uh, that people have a tendency to respect most because they, can, um, they, they have a greater chance of being able to understand the logic. They live inside of a system um, that those customs and mores are simply a part of. Um, rather than, 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 an, than an outside force, either an imperial power, a colonial power, or a, um, or a previous generation that they have, have constrained their choices, have imposed. And it's only when you have respect for the sources of law and the sources of custom um, and the authority, not the power, but the authority of these local customs, which are oftentimes codified into law, do you actually have stability um, that, that, that is the form of what we call the rule of law? So one of the thinkers that you cannot avoid and that Scruton deals with, uh, with, with a lot of, um, a lot of, um, of um, in a lot of detail throughout is, is Edmund Burke, uh, who had an illustrious parliamentary career, but um, was a critic uh, a prominent critic of the French Revolution, um, and uh, uh, who wrote wrote a good bit of, of the conservative canon, as we might call it, wrote that we were formed to conserve. We were formed to conserve, and so from the very beginning of conservative thinking and conservative, um, um, this is almost a, um, an oxymoron, but conservative activism or conservative political action. There has been a critique of conservatives as simply wanting to hold on to vestiges of the past and uh, not wanting to let go of institutions or of, uh, or of practices from the past and simply not wanting to move into the future. And so, so this is Burke's response to this. And this ultimately becomes the most useful response to conservatives over time is that we reform in order to be able to conserve. It's taking these first principles, which is another differentiating factor between conservatives and, and sort of a more liberal or libertarian perspective, is there's a commitment to first principles that ultimately end up being applied to uh, different moments in time. And it's these first principles that we have seen um, inform the way that uh, different generations uh, that have come before us respond to challenges or to pressures or, or, or to growth, merely, uh, you know, population growth. And so, <coughs> excuse me again. And so, um, so this, this, this idea of, of reforming in order to conserve is this application of principles that have been agreed upon through uh, either a, a, a shared common religion or shared cultural mores. There's, there's different, different uh, theories on where the sources of these would come from. Tocqueville calls these the, the mores and uh, doesn't really hide uh, the fact that it's, it's religion that provides the moral vocabulary for defining the mores. 
uh, even if it's, you know, if, if you kind of think of yourselves as being, you know, if you were to be picked up and placed into another culture, if you had to move for a period of time to, to Germany or to the United States, being kind of enculturated in Romania, uh, you would know instinctively the, um, you know, the mores of, of Romanian culture and Romanian um, ways of, of, of doing life and even, even codified law. You would know that uh, almost instinctively. But then in other places, you have to navigate that uh, in a much more um, in a much more careful way that a, uh, a person who, who is from that context would, um, would, would not have, have to do. And so um, the cons this 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 um, you know this 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 sense of belonging and the sense of being a part of um, of a community and not just simply being a um, an individual doesn't only give rise to the rule of law. It gives rise to a certain uh, a certain way of thinking and speaking about society um, that's significant. That's different from other perspectives. And so you don't have within a truly conservative um, system, you don't have elites that talk about uh, them and us. It's always we, it's the first pl person plural, it's the way that Scruton describes that we, they understand themselves to be a part of, of uh, society, they, they understand themselves to be a part of, of uh, you know, pre the present community um, and not as, uh, not as overlords who are imposing some sort of that foreign value upon, um, upon um, you know, an, an unwilling population. So um, if uh, I think that we have about 15 to 20 minutes left, is that before we open to Q&A? Is that right? Yes, indeed. That's fine. Perfect. Okay. So, so I'd like to turn a bit to um, some of the discussion that, that, that Scruton has with regard to contrasting um, the French and the American revolutions, and and I think that I'm I'm hoping that that would be in, be an instructive uh, conversation, um, especially given the, the 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 centering of the American Constitution in uh, in world news over the last few days, and uh, so he. He, he speaks briefly, or actually at length, um, maybe in the second and the sixth chapter, I think, about the, um, the, the nature of the American Constitution. And I will say that here in the US, there is some degree of uh, argument over whether or not the American Constitution is a conservative document or if the American Constitution is a classically liberal document. Uh, there's, in fact, an, a huge book that came up. It's actually quite a brilliant book by Richard Epstein several years ago called The Classical Liberal Constitution. It's about 800 pages long, and it's a very, um, it's a very uh, um, insightful, academic, serious treatment of that. But this, is, this is obviously not the position that Scruton, uh, that Scruton um, takes. And I think that if you understand the American Constitution in, in the context of uh, historical events and the influences on uh, on the writing of the Constitution, uh, you will you would you would probably reach the same conclusions that Scruton has has reached. Uh, the early American um, you know uh, influences on the framing of the Constitution, like uh, Thomas Jefferson, for example, um, held conservative ideas. He was influenced by conservative ideas, and these are things that sort of play out in both the Constitution and in the American Bill of Rights. He understands that the Constitution to be something that is, um, that is providing continuity between a, uh, a, the, a, a British system that's now been, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's uh, now manifests itself in a different context. In fact, one of the American framers, uh, John Dickinson, who uh, was from Pennsylvania, the signer of the Constitution and to the Declaration of Independence, actually up until the very last moment um, during the revolutionary period, rejected and resisted um, uh, the Declaration of Independence and the Revolutionary War because uh, he believed that what, what the uh, colonists were doing was to take an axe to the to the the, the line that held the anchor 
um, that there was there was a separation or a severing from several hundred years worth of uh, of uh, of Anglo uh, Anglo tradition for freedom uh, and for liberty, and so um, that 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 entire generation, the generation of the framers, really had very little. Uh, true classical liber, uh, liberal or libertarian. Um, they were they were purely classical liberal. They were purely classical liberal um, uh, among them. And uh, Jefferson um, Jefferson represents you know very clearly uh, you know, sort of like the the more conservative instantiation of those ideas. You had continuity. You had custom. And there was a resistance to centralization. So you see in the American Constitution reserved a list of reserved rights for the, the central federal government that was designed to be quite weak. Um, but then power, everything else was 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 explicitly given to the individual states that still maintained um, sovereignty over the course of the last two hundred and. 50 years, that's obviously been something that has eroded and American government has become more and more centralized. The federal government has become more and more powerful. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, but the, uh, the US Constitution, properly understood, is a document that fits around pre-existing rights. It doesn't attempt to articulate something that's new. Um, it's, it's, it makes explicit reference and incorporates the English tradition of common law. And so every bit of, of, of English law up until the moment of the ratification of the Constitution is actually binding law in the United States. Now, over the course of time, some of that has been uh, abrogated, some of it has been, um, ha has been preempted by other things. It's very, very rare at this point, especially, but, but not even um, as recently as 100 years ago. That American courts might make reference to English common law courts and English common law principles that preceded that preceded the um, the uh, American founding. And one of the most important things I think it's also a differentiation not just between classical liberals but also between civil law um, civil law traditions like you you might find in most of Europe and common law traditions that are such an important part of the Anglo-American conservative tradition is the, is the concept of the nature of rights and the, and the source of rights. Now, you obviously will find those within civil law systems and you'll, you'll find um, legal theorists. Um, you, know, um, you know, Thomas Aquinas himself was not, you know, quote, a common lawyer or a common lawyer uh, in the sense of Blackstone in the English tradition. Um, but you, do, you would have, uh, you know, a concept that is derived from um, from that that natural law tradition that uh, we would we would describe rights as being middle terms, and this is important for Anglo American uh, Anglo American conservatism. Rights as middle terms, and so what this what what rights will find themselves where they find themselves in the middle in terms of 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 uh, of being able to rightly be understood as middle term is that you have first principles that can be rationally deduced into or rationally reduced into rights and then rights ultimately then inform judgments inside of a common law system of, of justice and um and so conservatives and conservative conception of law and conservative conception of rights dictate uh, or presumes, I shouldn't say dictate, but it presumes the necessity of law to be able to preserve freedom. This is the, this is the purpose of law inside of a, of a conservative system, that freedom is always on attack. <coughs> Excuse me. Freedom is always under attack, and there's a, there, it must be protected by uh, the law, um, but you can't have simply a, uh, you know, a, um, uh, you know, a social contract, so to speak, uh, that could change with each generation or could change with the introduction of a new person, every new person into society. That you have to have um, systems of justice and institutions of justice that are limited in power and limited in scope to be able to preserve freedom. And 
in order to be able to do that, you have to have a guiding a guiding philosophy, and that ultimately becomes the common law conception of rights as middle terms. Now, there are um, systems in which you know, these are these are obviously rejected, and in, in the both the American and the English traditions, um, it's fairly rare to see rights as middle terms uh, asserted in quite this way, sort of in the common law tradition. Um, because you end up with you know, the rise of, of the idea of, of what is called in the U.S. and England judicial supremacy, where judges actually have the, the, last, the last say on what the law is and how it functions, and rather than legislatures, which are the, the, in, the institutions of democratic debate, where the people have the most, uh, the people have representation, and the people have the most, um, the most influence. And so, um, so this, uh, so what's what's significant here in the last several days is, is, is all of you have surely heard of the, the, the Dobbs decision that's overruled Roe v. Wade. Uh, when Roe v. Wade was handed down in 1973, dissent by Justice Byron Byron White referred to the majority opinion as a as a, um, sheer judicial power. It was a display of sheer judicial power. It, was, it, it absolutely. Um, was devoid of any kind of, of democratic uh, deliberation in the way that um, the way that the U.S. Constitution sort of frames the way that laws are come into uh, come into existence, or and uh, and basically set up a regime that was that was divorced from the democratic process. In the Dobbs opinion, if you read it just simply as, uh, and, and you do your best to sort of separate it from. Uh, you know the uh, the debate, the policy debates, and the, the very heated debates over over the abortion question, and simply read it as a uh, um, uh, a piece of analytic jurisprudence. For example, um, Samuel Alito does a masterful job um, of of writing this majority opinion and walking back the excesses of uh, of the way that the, the uh, Roe v. Wade was originally framed by those who, who wrote it and signed on to it, and reasserts this concept of rights as middle terms, that you have to have you have to have first principles that will then inform rights and, and be able to establish rights for rights then to be able to uh, to culminate in judgments. And so pregnant within Alito's majority opinion, um, in the Dobbs case, is uh, is a recognition that this these earlier cases that um, Dobbs and the, or I'm sorry uh, Roe and, and Casey simply pull out you know any kind of a of a need for first principles and just simply assert a right and then reach a judgment. And uh, you know, am I hopeful that this is a, a return to sort of like the historical classical conservative common law tradition? Of understanding um, the relationship of these first principles and the way that we we govern and the way the way that we live with one another, I'm not particularly optimistic that, that many people are going to be convinced. Um, but it at least does represent a uh, a return to the uh, to the way in which um, you know scrutiny would approve of uh, of um, rights being understood and political communities being interest, understood. Because not only do you have uh, you know, this, this concept of rights as middle terms where you've got first principles that inform rights and inform judgments, you also have a, a, on a grander scale, you have people, and then the process of politics is supposed to be the process of settlement, the process of understanding how to live with one another to define your community and define the terms in which you live, and then from these principles that you can, you can uh, that have come from wrestling with those, you ultimately have the emergence of a formalized government, or at least that's the way that the, you know, the, the it, it should work in theory, and the, the and the way that it manifests itself then sort of in the judicial function of government is this idea of a return to these first principles. That have, have been decided by over the course of time, shared religion, shared experience, um, democratic, uh, the democratic process of, of, of wrestling with uh, the way in which people bump up against one another when they live in community, and then ultimately 
ultimately preaching the account of the judgments, of judgments that would be judicial judgments, and only then can those actually be respected. Um, I've I've skipped over, uh, you know, Adam Smith. I've skipped over Hobbes and Rousseau. There's a lot, obviously, in this in this book, even though it's short. Um, but we've reached the point where um, Mihail, you might have some, some things to add that I've uh, that I've, I've missed, um, or we can we can open it to discussion and questions. No, thank you so much, Trey. Uh, I have not much to add. I just think it's great that you've contextualized uh, the discussion and you've referred to a truly remarkable event in the political life of the American community, American nation, and that's uh, truly the reversal of the um, Roe versus Wade decision taken in uh, 1973. Do you think, do you think, uh, speaking of Roger Scruton, do you think in 1973 he would be, he would have been in favor of the decision and uh, today he would have been again in favor of the reversal? Oh, that's a good question. I, you know, I don't know enough about the evolution of his worldview. Uh, I mean, I, I imagine that he probably would have seen it, seen the 1973 decision as being problematic. And uh, even in the U.S., you do find some people who are intellectually honest enough to say they may they may agree with or they may, may you know a policy of sort of broad access to abortion, which I, I can't really speak for Street. I'm not sure where he lands on that. Um, but would have rejected Roe as simply being bad law as a usurpation of, of the process uh, that's a conservative informed process of, um, of understanding rights and vindicating rights and defining rights um, in a community. Um, so I don't know. That's, that's, a, that's an excellent question. I'm not it's sure also a refutation of this insistence on uh, local culture and um, personal knowledge, so to speak, because uh, what I really like about America is the moment you move from Texas to California, and sometimes I do that, or to Seattle, and sometimes I do that too, uh, you, you realize this is a huge country, a, more of a country is a continent with various uh, mores, uh, laws, which are pertaining to a specific, to a specific geography for a very for a very clear reason, that geography, like the geography of the former Republic of Texas, has a history which is unique to Texas and very different from the history of, say, Maryland. And, and so any attempt to centralize, even from a <clears throat> legislative perspective, is also an act of revenge, uh, and I would call it even intellectual terror um, um, uh, against local cultures and that's what we see in Europe we see right now an attempt in Brussels uh, among the bureaucrats living in Brussels to implement laws which will be identical in Croatia and Denmark despite the fact that Croatia as a uh, as a Catholic country has a completely different moral landscape than Denmark or uh, I don't know uh, uh, Holland Netherlands so that insistence on the local genius of local cultures is something very conservative, which which has been celebrated recently by this decision. Would you agree? Yeah, and ultimately it's destabilizing. It's destabilizing to impose upon um, <clears throat> impose law upon people, and this is this is actually a problem here, you know, in the United States, uh, and not just through things that we that are as visible or as notable as. Uh, Roe v. Wade and, and ultimately its reversal in Dobbs. Um, but we have um, every single aspect of American law is derived from, from British common law or English common law. Um, but slowly over time, everything in, you know, from, from how we understand property to how we understand contracts that are made between um, individuals or corporations has been replaced um, by a... Um, by, uh, you know, a, a adopted law that's been posited and imposed upon people, even though um, you, you, the, the, the way in which uh, people have sort of understood their place uh, in relationship to those in their community and how they did business with them had evolved over the course of several years. I mean, one of the things Scruton says about tradition 
is that tradition isn't just some sort of randomly, uh, you know, randomly uh, derived principles, to, um, but they are, they are agreed upon solutions to problems from the past. And uh, ultimately, um, you know, I think that that's a, you know, I try to be as humble as I can possibly be with regard to uh, being an American. I try to be as humble as I can possibly be with regard to uh, the EU and the, the wisdom of, of um, the things that the EU would do. But um, I would definitely fall into the um, camp of being a sovereigntist and saying that, it, that it's, it's local custom, uh, it's, it's sort of the, an understanding of, of local mores that, are, that, are, that ultimately provide the, the substance of social cohesion and that trying to impose these from Brussels um, is, is ultimately going to destabilize local communities and, lo and, and nation states, but also the, the entire continent eventually. Oh, excellent. We have Troy Nelson, the lawyer from, from Texas with us. We have other friends from uh, Oradea, that's Transylvania. We have Ilana Fogel from Germany, and probably she would very much uh, uh, echo what you have just said. Uh, she's very much an anti-federalist when it comes to uh, these decentralizing uh, uh, tendencies uh, in Brussels. Who would like to who would like to butt in? Who would like to make a comment? Uh, Roger Scruton, being of course uh, a titan, a giant, uh, we are very glad to present yet another book of his, and this is against the tide. And uh, I thank um, a colleague of ours. Maria Tsiganou, she, she gave me this book and I'm very grateful. Any book by Scruton tends to be accessible with one exception, which is very, very bizarre. That's called Sexual Desire. I thought Sexual Desire would be a, 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 fun, a fun book to read, but it's not. It's, it's, very, it's very technical. He talks about animal instincts and, and sentiments, but it's, uh, it's very different from what you, you would expect. Uh, all the other country, all the other books uh, written by Scruton are very accessible, including these wonderful introductions. In 1996, we have with uh, we had our first translation of Scruton, and that was a book on Spinoza uh, by Scruton, uh, in which uh, he explains uh, the philosophy uh, and the metaphysics, the political philosophy and the metaphysics of uh, this. Uh, early defender of democracy in, in Netherlands. Who would like to comment? Would like to make a, <coughs> a remark? Estera? Camelia? Camelia, you always have something important, smart, insightful to say. <clears throat> Let me grab something not so smart first, maybe. Oh, Troy, uh, please. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> first of all, Trey, thank you so much. It was a wonderful presentation. Wonderful. Uh, uh, the... Uh, each thing you said, I think we could talk for hours, but, uh, but I would say that, uh, you know, it's interesting when you're talking about the change and, and, and things that are going on with this decision without getting into the details and things. Um, Trey, I know you've heard, and, and perhaps everyone has heard the news from the United States that this is an assault on democracy. And it's interesting. In fact, it's the because, contrary. In fact, it's just the contrary. <laughs> exactly. You know, this is the thing. We have we have elections. We have we have senates. We have legislatures that have passed laws, and they've passed them through democratic votes. And now those laws will be enacted because the federalists are not 